I'm the gangster nerd, and I love professional wrestling. I love the history, the people, behind the scenes, all of it. You know what I hate? Is when the promoters come and give my beloved professional wrestling a bad name. Screwing over wrestlers, making bad business decisions, you name it. I'm Walt the Most Gangster Nerd on YouTube, and these are six of the biggest pieces of f I'm sorry. And these are the six worst promoters in the history of professional wrestling. Number six, Paul Heyman. Now I know this one's a bit controversial. Paul Heyman is without a doubt one of the greatest pro wrestling managers and bookers ever. Period. However, this ain't a booker or a manager list. In 1993, Paul Heyman would come into then Eastern Championship Wrestling, a relatively small company trying to maintain a territory feel when the territory business was on its deathbed. It wouldn't take long, however, before Paul was able to push founder Todd Gordon out the way and take the company in a more extreme direction. One thing that put the entire wrestling business on notice would come in 1994, when Paul Heyman made an agreement with then NWA president Dennis Corluzzo to book Shane Douglas as NWA world champion and exchange talent so both businesses could do better. What actually happened was Shane Douglas won the title, then immediately dropped it, disrespected it, and started using the event and venue as a build-up for ECW. And he did all of this on Paul Heyman's order. Now maybe disrespecting the lineage of perhaps the most prestigious championship of all time would be enough, but Paul here is an overachiever. His egregious treatment of talent is the stuff of legend, not only breaking the rule of never asking the talent to do anything the promoter wouldn't do on a regular basis, that even Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon have kept to over the years, Seriously, how many 15 to 20 foot plunges is Paul Heyman known for? And then the financials, not of ECW, which deserves a video all to itself, but how he quite literally soaked his talent for their money, their family's money, would wreck their credit, would bounce checks, and flat out lie. Tommy Dreamer alone lost over $100,000 leasing the ring truck, leasing office buildings, and never to be paid back by Paul. The financial ruin of Chris Candido, Tammy Sitch, The Sandman, Sabu, and many others can be traced straight back to Paul Heyman and his business acumen. Number 5. Carlos Colon Patriarch of the Colon family as well as owner and promoter of the Puerto Rico wrestling territory, Carlos Colon is a highly successful wrestler turned entrepreneur who has maintained a multiple decade death grip on the wrestling business in Puerto Rico. Now that in and of itself isn't a big deal at all really, but what is a big deal is his role in the murder of Bruiser Brody. On July 16th, 1988, in Puerto Rico, Jose Gonzalez aka Invader One lured Bruiser Brody into the shower area where he then stabbed him to death. There are several rumors and theories on how and why this happened, but at the time, Carlos Colon was $40,000 behind on Bruiser Brody's pay. Bruiser Brody was a notoriously difficult person to work with by many accounts. Being owed 40 grand could not possibly have helped anything. What is definitely known is Carlos Colon was totally and definitely on the side of Jose Gonzalez. Paying for his defense and keeping him booked as a hero in top babyface while his court proceedings moved along. To add to that, Carlos Colon, being the biggest star and promoter in Puerto Rico, had, this had allowed him to develop contacts and connections. All of the American wrestlers that were there that night received subpoenas to testify after the jury reached its verdict. To add insult to injury, in the years since, Carlos Colon has ran various angles where wrestlers will vow to rev get revenge for Bruiser Brody's murder. And even worse than that, he still employs Jose Gonzalez to this day and draws money off of the Bruiser Broder murder. Number 4. Ole Anderson Considered by many to be the most miserable man on planet Earth, Ole Anderson aka Alan Rogowski is no stranger to controversy nor is he a stranger to being hated, as he seemed to gain both with incredible ease all through his entire career and life. Being an innovator of the cowardly tough guy approach to everything, Ole was infamous for his hazing and stretching of green talent. One wrestler remembered the day would start off weight training, then wrestle training drills, then more workouts, followed by running insanely long sprints, as well as running all the aisles of the Georgia Arena. And after all of this, then, they would have to get in the ring with Ole, who hadn't done a damn thing. 
He would then proceed to take liberties and stretch the new recruits. Along with his treatment of talent, Ole also had a way of doing business that in retrospect left a lot to be desired. In 1983, Ole decided it was a good idea to try and expand Georgia Championship Wrestling, pushing north into Ohio and trying to push west into Texas, attempting to start a partnership with Joe Blanchard that Joe wisely declined. While attempting this, he would seem to forget all about Georgia, more specifically Atlanta, as fans there were left out. But the one thing Ole did that cements his place on this list, he managed to screw himself out of everything. Still in the year 1983, Ole would gather all the partners and shareholders at Georgia Championship Wrestling and push out the legendary wrestling god Jim Barnett. Thinking that Barnett was behind the times, old, weak, and even went as far as accusing him of embezzling funds. This would be Ole's fatal mistake, as Jim Barnett would go straight to Vince McMahon selling him his shares, and guiding him through the process of pushing Ole out. Ole would lose his primetime TV spot, his territory, and not too long after, be forgotten as compared to what he once was. Number 3. Herb Abrams Herb Abrams would found the UWF in 1990, starting off with a bang by stealing the name from legendary wrestler and promoter Bill Watts. He would come out the gate swinging, landing a national TV deal and stacking his roster with super impressive talent. But you know sometimes you may have all the ingredients, but you just can't cook. Well Herb Abrams shouldn't have been allowed near a kitchen. Literally, he tried to market oatmeal cookies endorsed by legendary wrestlers. What? But worse than that, his actual wrestling program. The UWF completely lacked any booking. Finishes were weak, ridiculous, and pretty much non-existent. Booking dream matches without real winners, really reinventing the countout. He even had a lumberjack match end in a countout. What? And then there was the blatant racism. Colonel De Beers and his whole South African militant gimmick was completely tasteless. Mondo Guerrero's gimmick and intro music was offensive. Herb even thought booking Little Tokyo, the first midget champion, yes, that really happened. Unfortunately, Herb Abrams passed in 1996, and with his death came the end of the UWF. Number 2. Dixie Carter What can be said about her destruction of TNA that hasn't already been said a hundred times? Seriously, Jim Cornette has logged hours of dialogue on this subject alone. But so is a lot of other people. Dixie somehow found her way into quote-unquote running TNA after Panda Energy bought into and later pushed out the Jarrett's. Dixie, for some reason, was put in charge. Dixie herself said she thought it was fun to run the wrestling business, and a lot of fun it must have been, as TNA Impact to date has lost millions of dollars, due in no small part to Dixie's business ideas. With that out the way, she infamously released Jim Cornette and kept wrestling antichrist Vince Russo, made the now ridiculous deals with both Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan for absurd amounts of money, decided it was a good idea for TNA to go head up against WWE Raw, and that's just what everybody knows about. What a lot of people are not in the know on is much like other promoters on this list, the number of wrestlers who have been paid late or stiffed is totally unacceptable. Her screwing Tommy Dreamer last minute on his House of Hardcore show after he had already kept his end of a deal, then taking offense when he cut a kayfabe promo on her at that show that was never aired anyway, shows just how much of a smart mark she actually is. Also, under her leadership, the state of Tennessee has a tax lien against TNA, and they are currently being sued by, well, everyone. Number 1. Ian Rotten Oh God. This guy may have single-handedly inflicted more damage to the credibility of professional wrestling than any of these people combined and multiplied, and that is really saying something. Ian would start IWA Mid-South in 1996, an outlaw promotion, with a very brutal hardcore style. So hardcore, in fact, performers have been airlifted to hospitals with punctured veins and life-threatening injuries. Ian himself does believe in the rule of don't ask the talent to do anything you wouldn't do, However, judging by these pictures of him, that rule may be having the reverse effect, as he's willing to do this to himself, so doing this to others is no real thing. But don't think it stops there. This man is number one on this list for a reason, and it's not because he's notorious for screwing wrestlers on payouts, not for promoting benefit shows and then keeping all proceeds, not for canceling shows on fans without giving refunds. 
not because he admitted to selling J.C. Bailey pain pills who later overdosed, though that could do it. No, what puts Ian Rotten on this list is much worse. Should you attend an IWA Mid-South event, pro tip, wear a latex suit. You're going to need it. As the Kentucky Athletic Commission revoked his promoter's license and wrestling license after at an event where talent already massacring one another managed to bleed on fans and spectators, yes, this really happened. And how did Ian Rotten handle this? He goes before the commission and cut a wrestling promo saying he should be able to do whatever he wants. Brilliant. But what may be so egregious to the point of criminal neglect is the fact that this gentleman has hepatitis C and this guy has bled a lot in a lot of matches. Remember that crowd thing from a minute ago? Yeah, think about it. And that's our list. You got a problem with it? Did I totally nail it? Are you mad because you didn't know? Tell me all about it in the comments. I'm Walt the Most Gangsta Nerd on YouTube and I'll see you soon enough.